You've heard me talk on many occasions the reality of white voters in this country, how broke white folks are fully supportive of Donald Trump. It really makes no sense whatsoever. And yesterday, the topic came up on MSNBC, where former host Chris Matthews raised the issue when they were talking about how these white folks, especially evangelicals, evangelicals are treating Donald Trump like he is God. Watch this. When I was up there in New Hampshire, my 10th primary up there, I saw a lot of really poor people waiting in line for two hours to see Donald Trump. Really poor people, white people in most cases. Mm. And I said, what's going on here? And I don't know if these are the cross tabs relate or why it relates, but they really want this guy to be their president again. And then I saw the F Florida Atlantic University poll that came out in March. And it pointed out that all, the only economic group in the country that likes Trump is under 50,000 a year, not 50 to 100, not above 100, only been people below 50,000. I can't put it all together, but as, uh -huh. maybe people are hard up. People have a, a grievance against society because th society has been tough on them. White, Hispanic, uh, black, all kinds of people below 50,000 a year are for Trump. Somebody's got to get that into their heads that that's what's going on here. And somebody's got to start thinking about why Trump is appealing to those people who are hard up. And people like in the White House, like Reschetti and Mike Donlin and Anita Dunn, somebody in that big, smart group of anonymous people have got to start thinking about who they're up against. Trump has been able to wire himself into people of basic needs who live out there are not rich. They're not all going to Florida to get the tax break. They're not like that crowd. Or that crowd really is out there, too. That crowd's going to benefit from these poor people. The people looking to get a tax break from Trump. They're going to get they're going to benefit from that. The people below in the econ lower economic groups, they're, they're just going to get left out. And it's so clear. So Democrats have got to get to the people they've always rooted for, the people at the bottom, the people with true grievance. They've always said we're for those people. They got to start rooting for them somehow, obviously. And that means Biden has got to start talking to them. And it's not happening yet. Mm -hmm. Trump's talking to them. As somebody once said of FDR, he, I didn't know him, but he knew me. Trump knows those people. When he was up there in in New Hampshire, I heard him say something. My people have figured out that I should come to this area, Laconia, because there's a lot of poor people. And he said, it's the right. way he did. Remember, remember back in 2016 when he beat Hillary, he went to Erie and he went to Wilkesboro, to Luzerne County. He knew where his, Hillary was stuck down in Philly. He knew where he was going. I think people like David Urban, who was running his campaign last time, they know where to advance him. They're going to go out there and advance him to the right places. And I tell you, it's, it's fast. I don't know if the Democrats have really thought through this campaign and what they're up against. This guy's calling himself God. God. Yeah. Thou shalt not have strange God. Hello. God the, yeah. And if he can get away with that, then he is truly a cult. And people got to be taught, I mean, thought through it with them. Somebody's got to start talking to people and saying to them, this guy is not for real as a secular leader. He's not Jesus. Now, on another day, they had a similar conversation and Matthew said this. First white people in the world. I mean, they're on their rags on their, on their backs. They look like East Germans coming out of the East Berlin back in the 80s. Uh, they, they were waiting for Trump for two hours, and they believe everything he says. And they had this notion that you know, the family, the flag, uh, the country, this really big primitive notion of, of what they care about, the religion, everything. He's tying into that. He's saying, I'm your, I'm your, I'm your savior. I'm taking the bullet for you. I'm saving you to his faith and, and, and country and a family. Trump has perverted all of that, and I know, I know, because I grew up in the Southern Baptist the Church. The evangelicals love him. They, and, and, and what do they love? I mean, some evangelicals love him. Evangelical, though, even the term, mm -hmm. has stopped meaning going yeah. to church. It's become a social identifier. Yeah. Okay, it's a social identifier where I support authoritarian forms of government. I support using anti-democratic uh, approaches to to get what I want. Um, it has nothing to so do with Christian nationalism. Is that what that is? Yes. Christian nationalism is you pick three or four issues, and maybe it's trans reading library books. Maybe it's maybe it's guns. Well, it is guns, which is the most bizarre thing. It's guns. Uh, it's abortion. It's immigration. It's immigration. Right. Which which let me just tell you. 
I mean, yeah, that sure lines up. Like hating all immigrants sure lines up with what Ronald Reagan or what Jesus said when he was talking about the Good Samaritan. I mean, none of this makes sense. Sure, it's love. None of it. that embassy to yes. New Hampshire. All right, so allow me to unpack. Um, what the conversation failed to do was to really unpack that and, and walk through that and get people to understand really what's at play, okay? So Chris Matthews says that, what is it about these 50,000 and under? Who does Trump lose in the biggest? College educated people. What's his group? Non-college educated people. So he's purposely playing on people who are not as smart as others. Now, let me be perfectly clear, I'm not saying all those with college degrees are smarter than those without, but it's also discerning the lies from the truth. And so what Donald Trump does very well is he lies. He paints this broad picture. He says, oh, I'm fighting for you, I'm standing with you. But all of those broke white folks Chris Matthews talking about, they couldn't even walk through the lobby one of his hotels. But see, he presents this whole notion of the plane, the excess, and so they're like, I could have that life. I could have that life. But you can't. You can't have that life. <clears throat> and you're not going to have that life. Because he says this one thing, but he does something else. So he, his fight against China, tariffs. Oh, I'm making them pay. It's not how tariffs works. You actually pay more. In fact, he's saying reelect me and I'm going to impose more tariffs on China. And you, you, you know what's then going to happen? What's then going to happen is it's going to cost more people more for Americans to buy goods. Those are facts. Now, those folks who are believing that, they don't understand that. They look at you like you're crazy, like, what are you talking about? It's not going to cost me more money. Because Trump said it's going to save us money. They believe the lie. And so he feasts on that. He feasts on ignorance. And he weaponizes ignorance. So when you look at his tax cut, his tax cut did not help any of those broke white people or the broke Latinos or the broke black folks who listened to Donald Trump. It didn't because they're not in that income bracket. He bragged in front of a bunch of rich people at Mar-a-Lago. I made y'all a lot of money and I'm gonna do it again because that's who he cares about. So the Republican Party has created this notion that we're for the little man. Really? So how can you be for the little man but you oppose a living wage? How can you be for the, li how can you be for the little man when you oppose Medicaid expansion? How can you be for the little man when the Republicans are passing laws in Florida and Texas preventing cities from passing laws requiring uh, businesses to provide water and water breaks for people who work outdoors. Now, where Chris Matthews is correct is Biden-Harris, they've got to speak to those voters. Last three years, Reverend William Barber has been trying to get a meeting with President Biden, not by himself. But Barbara always says in the Poor People's Campaign, they always put up affected workers. The Biden White House has been unwilling to actually do that. He says, no, the president needs to hear from affected workers, poor workers. They don't want to hear from that. The fact is, poor to low income workers are a huge voting block that has not been tapped. Chris is right, Democrats haven't reached him. But Chris said, 
Trump is focused on the family flag and country. Trump's family flag in the country in 2024 is no different than what Howard Dean said about Republicans in 2004 when he said, God gays guns. So, God gays guns. God's still the same, but Trump now presents himself as the Messiah. The gay part in 2004 is now transgender. The gun part ain't changed. He's playing to a fictionalized view of what America used to be. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You're watching a movie and they're talking about the American dream. And you see people on the big screen, they're smiling and they're talking about the nice home and the suburbs and a, or a white picket fence and where mom is at home and the kids come home from school and she's got an apron on and she's got baked cookies for them and then daddy pulls up from home with his briefcase and he kisses mommy and hugs the kids and grabs the paper and then begins to ask them how their day was. That is literally the world that Donald Trump presents. And for a lot of white people, that was America. But in that same time, black folks were getting their heads split open. Houses were being bombed. Jim Crow was running rampant. And so what you have is you have a set of people who are pining for another America. That America that we used to be. The America where we used to go to church as a family, the America where it was man and woman and not these gay people and these trans people. America where we stood for the flag and we sang proudly uh, the national anthem. That, that's really what he's doing. But these people are not paying any attention to actually what he's saying. They are paying no attention to the massive lies. They're paying no attention to the craziness that's literally coming out of his mouth. They're paying no attention to his economic policies and how they did not and will not help any of these people. They're not. So they're sitting here thinking, that's my God, that's my God. Which is why I keep trying to tell black folks, we can't sit this thing out. The reason I'm saying that to black folks, the reason we can't sit it out is because these people are mesmerized by Trump. But see, where Morning Joe didn't want to go, they didn't want to deal with the issue of race. I lay this thing out in my book, White Fear. I lay it out. Don't forget, President Lyndon Johnson called it as well. Remember this quote? He said, if you can convince the lowest white man, he's better than the best colored man. He won't notice you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him somebody to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. That's what is going on. Oh, these things are happening for our very eyes. And what people don't want to deal with, they don't deal with the reality that Donald Trump is speaking a very explicit language of race. Yeah, what he's talking about is, oh, how the demonizing the immigrants and they're the reason, it's them that's causing these problems. How dare they? He's already said, I'm sending everybody back on day one. And these poor white people are like, yeah, that's it. That's it, because they got our jobs. They're taking our jobs. But he's also doing this. This is from Axios, exclusive. Trump allies plot anti-racism protections for white people. Hmm. If Donald Trump returns to the White House, close allies want to dramatically change the government's interpretation of civil rights era laws to focus on anti-white racism rather than discrimination against people of color. Trump's Department of Justice will push to eliminate or upend programs in government in corporate America that are designed to counter racism 
that has favored whites. Targets would range from decades-old policies aimed at giving minorities economic opportunities to more recent programs that began in response to the pandemic and the killing of George Floyd. Hmm. Did I not tell you that was coming? Did I not warn you that this is what they were planning all along? But you have to understand when you're talking about those poor white Americans, when you're talking about why are they so aggrieved? Remember, they were there in 2016. They were there in 2020. And their grievances were there because they even see black folks problem. So how do you think the anti-CRT took hold? What do you think is the reason behind right now anti-DEI? What do you think? We could go on and on and on. This is all a part, folks, of the same situation. Now, here's what you got to remember. Pew did a study, and 13% of whites who think they suffer a lot of discrimination. Thirteen percent. Now, let me set this up for you. So this is the graphic right here. Large majorities see at least some discrimination against many groups in our society. Muslims, Jews, Arab people, black people, Hispanics, Asian people, evangelical Christians. Those last two right there, those are Trump voters. So when Trump is attacking migrants, when he's attacking DEI, when he's attacking things like that, keep in mind, it's Stephen Miller, who was a top Trump aide, who sued to block the money to the black farmers, who's suing other folks as well. This is also about race. It's about race. It's about how can you reach that individual, reach that poor white person and get them to buy into your vision and get them to see that you are the one who could change this. You are the one who can be the difference. So therefore, elect you and oh, that demon, that demon Joe Biden that demon Kamala Harris. Oh no, those people, they are the reasons. They are the ones, they are the fundamental problem. So therefore, it must be me. But see, this is where Morning Joe also completely missed the mark because they did not talk about history. They did not talk about in the history of America, every period, of, of every period where you've had black success has been followed by white backlash. They talk about that. They didn't talk about what we keep seeing happening in this country when it comes to uh, whites and how they respond. But see, a lot of people don't realize is that you can take this thing all the way back to post-slavery. You can take it all the way back to when plantation owners, they were the ones who said, whoa, 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 look. We, we can't have these poor white people and these freed slaves of African descent joining together. Mm-hmm. This is what MLK said in his book, excuse me, in his speech after the Selma to Montgomery march. He said, our whole campaign in Alabama has been centered around the right to vote and focusing the attention of the nation and the world today on the flagrant denial of the right to vote. We're exposing the very origin, the root cause of racial segregation in the Southland. Racial segregation as a way of life did not come about as a natural result of hatred between the races immediately after the Civil War. 
There were no laws segregating the races then. And as the noted historian C. Van Woodward in his book, The Strange Career of Jim Crow, clearly points out, the segregation of the races was really a political strategy employed by the emerging bourbon interest in the South to keep the Southern masses divided and Southern labor the cheapest in the land. Y'all see right there? Southern labor the cheapest in the land. You see, it was a simple thing to keep the poor white masses working for near starvation wages in the years that followed the Civil War. Why, if, if the poor white plantation or mill worker became dissatisfied with his low wages, the plantation or mill owner would merely threaten to fire him and hire former Negro slaves and pay him even less. Thus, the Southern wage level was kept in almost unbearably low. Now, let me stop right there. You have poor whites, family, family flag country. Trump's my guy! But he opposes unions. He opposes living wages. Now, I need to, now that's, I'm sorry, that's, wait a minute, y'all broke. So let me just be real clear, okay? You're broke, you got awful health care. you got awful education. So you're supportive of the people who want to gut public education with vouchers. And those are actual scam programs. They're not meant to help the least of, the, uh, of all those. They're meant to help folk who are already sending their kids to private school who, or who have the means to but need several more thousand dollars to get it done. They're opposing health care. Trump wants to kill the Affordable Care Act. So if you, you poor and white, What's the one law that has actually helped your health care? The Affordable Care Act. And then wages. Hmm. So, King says this. Toward the end of the Reconstruction era, something very significant happened. This is what was known as the populist movement. The leaders of this movement began awakening the poor white masses and the former Negro slaves to the fact that they were being fleeced by the emerging bourbon interest. Not only that, but they began uniting the Negro and white masses into a voting bloc that threatened to drive the bourbon interest from the command post of political power in the South. To meet this threat, the Southern aristocracy began immediately to engineer this development of a segregated society. I want you to follow me through here because this is very important to see the roots of racism and the denial of the right to vote. Watch this! Through their control of mass media, they revised the doctrine of white supremacy. The use of mass media the conservative ecosystem, conservative radio, Fox News, digital media. Constant drumbeat, the anti-blackness being constantly fed to them drives this wedge. Go back, King says, they saturated the thinking of the poor white masses with it, thus clouding their minds to the real issue involved in the populist movement. Come back. So if I can keep y'all minds over here, then I can keep you from realizing you're being fleeced. So Fox News over here keeps saying, Emma, oh my God, inflation, has it gone down? It has. These are awful Biden programs. They're not. They're helping, they're not helping you. They are. So that's why you have Republicans who vote against infrastructure bill, but then take credit for the money when it comes there. That's why you have Re Re Republicans who vote against taking money that's actually helping to put broadband in rural communities, but then they actually take credit for it. But they're saturating the media, and so these poor whites, what do you think they're listening to? King says, they then directed the placement on the books of the South of laws that made it a crime for Negroes and whites to come together as equals at any level. And that did it. That crippled and eventually destroyed the populist movement of the 19th century. So when you hear people say Trump is a populist, Trump is a white nationalist populist. Trump's message is appealing 
to largely white people, white poor people. You do have some clueless Negroes who believe the nonsense, but that's who he is channeling his energy to because in the last election, 70% of those who voted were white. So when you hear me say we've got to have black folks vote voting at least 70% of our capacity because we've got to offset where those white folks are. If you change the election, you have to drive that number down to about 68, 67. Those three points makes the difference in Georgia, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Nevada, Arizona, seven battleground states. So all of you who are watching and listening, I need you to understand that Trump's messaging, strong guy, save America, only I can do it, love the flag, stand for the anthem, all about family. He's against everything that he says, but because he is a showman, because he's a circus leader, because he understands how to manipulate the minds, which is why he was reading all those Hitler books, because Hitler was a master of manipulation. These poor white folks are going, yes, 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 Trump's our guy, not realizing that they actually are going to be screwed. Remember those tariffs? When Trump was president, I'll never forget. They were white dairy farmers who filed for bankruptcy and lost their family farms because of Trump's nonsensical tariff war. And one of them actually said to a writer that it was worth losing my family farm for what Trump is doing. Mike Lindell literally destroyed his multi-million dollar uh, pillow business to advance Trump's lying election deal. John Eastman has been disbarred from practicing law because he stood up with Trump talking about the election was rigged. Sidney Powell is next. Rudy Giuliani lost a massive uh, case in Georgia. He owes in excess of th three plus million dollars. He actually owes way more than that for standing with the fool. So what am I telling you? These are so-called smart people who literally sacrifice their careers and their livelihoods for this fool Trump and he will never help them out. So poor white people and confused black people and confused Latino people. Let me make it clear. This man doesn't give a damn about you. He doesn't like you. He doesn't respect you. And he will do nothing for you other than sell you a pipe dream and hope you run with it while he laughs all the way to the bank. Joe, you first. You know, this is divide and conquer 101. It's always been this way. Um, how do you stay in charge when the people that you're in charge of have much more in common with each other than they do with you? The way that you do that is by uh, dividing and conquering, whether it was you know, back in the day, the, the, the field Negroes and the house Negroes, or whether it was white folks of simple means, uh, along with immigrants and other people of simple means, you can let that white cat know, well, you know, you're not the richest, but hey, you know, at, at least you're white and therefore superior. Uh, our brother Ozzie Davis talked about this in, in Jungle Fever, actually. Um, and so you continue to do that. So Trump's not doing a new thing, okay? Um, he's certainly elevating it for sure, but he's not doing a new thing. It's been happening since the very, very beginning. This is why people that have nothing to do and, and very little in common with regular people continue to be in charge of states that are diverse, uh, people of modest means. Most people are people of modest means, and it amazes me to no end 
what anyone with any type of dependence on any form of government support or government program at all would be doing voting for Donald Trump because their stuff is going to go away. Um, and I do agree that what they seem to miss in that reporting is just the notion that this country was about race from the very beginning. That's still the issue. That's still the key issue. That's still the thing that's more threatening to white folks, particularly white folks that want to be in charge than anything. It's always been about race. And so, um, and I don't necessarily expect that to change. It should be about class, right? But if it was really about class, the people that were in the same class that had connection because they had common and mutual interests would be living together, voting together, et cetera. Um, and so as long as that's not happening, the Donald Trumps of the world uh, can continue to win because they can actually look at him and, and overlook this whole mountain that represents their enlightened self-interest, what should be their enlightened self-interest. Here's what I need. I need health care. Here's what I need. I should unionize so that I can't just lose my job uh, after 20 years because they want to cut me away. Here's what I need. I need for my uh, you know, elderly person in my family to be able to have health care, you know, et cetera, and look over that entirely, despite all the evidence to the contrary, and look towards Trump, who's not from the city, who's not who's from the city. He's not rural. He's not any of these things. He didn't come from modest means either. There's no connection to him but this. That's all there is. So we have to stop paying attention. People have to stop paying attention to that suggestion. But it starts off by being honest about what we really have. Sure, you know, you can find a kernel of truth, I guess, in the, in, in the Chris Matthews argument about how he, the fact that Trump touched these, touches these folks. But you have to go back to the beginnings of this country and why we got mentioned in the Constitution as three-fifths of a person Mustafa, and no other group. Right. Mustafa, though, you can't run from it. You must challenge every lie. You must call him out. You must say that man is not going to do anything for you. And you have to be explicit. You must say, hey, poor white people. This man doesn't give a damn about you, and let me explain to you why. So, yeah, this, they should be doing that. Reverend Barber talks about it all the time. Democrats, the they should be mobilizing, organizing and mobilizing those low, poor, vote, low, low income and poor voters because actually they could flip this entire election and become a blowout if they target those folks and get them to turn out by saying, I've done stuff for you and I'm going to do more for you. And that fool won't do a damn thing for you. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, for some reason, we're uh, resistant or allergic in this country to say the word poor. Like you listen to politicians talk and they never talk about poor folks. The middle class, They're the middle class, the middle class. That's what it's about. And, you know, um, I grew up in Appalachia before I moved to Detroit. So folks often felt that the system um, had always failed them. They also always felt that nobody saw them. So Trump at least tells folks that he sees them. Now we know he's lying. We know that he doesn't care. We know all of the things that are untrue in that statement. But if you're not willing to acknowledge the fact that people are asking you to see them and not just see them, but also spend the respective amount of time that's necessary to understand the challenges that are happening inside of their communities. And then, as you just stated, be able to also help them to understand how you are already making investments and what the future sets of investments will look like to make sure that they can have that uh, life that they've always hoped that they would have. When Trump first won, I went back home uh, to visit my mother. And I remember I went into this meeting, listened to some people talk, um, and then afterwards, I asked them, I said, well, why did you vote for Trump? And a bunch of the folks said, because they could finally, finally become a millionaire. Now, a couple people chuckled after that, because some of the folks, you know, they never even graduated high school. Some did. Um, but when people perceive that they now have an opportunity, you have to also be able to address that perception that they have, because we know perception is a big driver. 
So this administration, you know, the Biden administration has actually put significant resources into communities across the country, has to do a better job of making sure folks, one, understand where they came from, but what does that change actually look like? And giving people something to hold on to, to know that if I give you my vote this time, that I will be able to you know, build upon the change that's happening. But folks have not, not done that in a very effective way. So yes, we can talk about Trump and his lies, but you gotta also talk about how you actually help Right. Everyday hardworking folks who may be lower income yep. to actually be able to see a better, better way forward. Yep. Randy. Well, Trump to me, what I mean, what is a white person's greatest currency, particularly um, a, per, a white person from modest means greatest currency? It is their whiteness. I mean, the reason why they are putting making uh, poor decisions when it comes to logic is because they recognize, although they don't want to speak about white privilege uh, or own that it does exist, they recognize that their greatest power, their greatest currency in life is their whiteness. So if you do have a person that is saying, I'm going to take you uh, back to the days where whiteness meant means more um, than it is these days. He is God to them. He is the Jesus. He is the second coming because that is, as you say so eloquently in your book, Roland, that is what they fear the most is this changing society. And so I also believe that what uh, the current administration needs to do is they need to talk frankly about that. While we are uncomfortable using the term poor and talking about economics, we're more afraid to talk about race and the changing demographics. And I think I would say to people, I understand that change is hard, but it's going to happen. The demographic is going to change. People are not going anywhere. Like we're not going to disappear. I don't. I, they seem to see, think that Trump is this big Superman that's going to, you know, change the world as it is, and it's not going to happen. So, what do we need to do to ensure the future for everybody? Because this man cannot take y'all to the promised land. We're not going back to, uh, you know, the 1800s. It's, it's not going to go back to, you know, we're not going to make America great again if great again means that all minorities are somehow pushed down and white people, regardless of their socioeconomics, are elevated. Um, so I, that's another, even with Dave Matthews, who's this seasoned, respected journalist, I feel like he skirts around talking about race and the power that it has on the population here because they're not looking at them. They're not, they don't, they're not, a lot of people are not even paying attention to um, the actual legislation and things that have been passed and things that have happened. All they know is this man gets up and essentially says that I'm going to take us back yep. and that you know, and that's all they care about. So we really need to address that. We got to get for real, for real and address that. And be honest, like, I know you're scared, but guess what? Ain't nobody in this country going anywhere. So how do we ensure that everyone from one, you know, all socioeconomic levels can get where they are living in a way that they want to live and they have opportunities. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media and investment. This next generation social app has already raised $10 million and has just opened a new round to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits.